so much for that introduction. Thank you, Jin. Um, and thank you for having me. Apologies for not being there in person. Um, just a series of, uh, of circumstances made it such that I couldn't, but I was very much looking forward to it. Um, in order to make this a little bit more interactive, um, I'll pause at uh, certain um, at the ends of certain sections, um, and hopefully people can just chime in with questions. Um, I, I would love to basically just make it a little bit more interactive that way. And um, and uh, I'm going to be covering several different uh, types of uh, applications here, but for uh, the next time we speak, maybe another seminar, I can talk about our pulse sequences and our RF pulses, which are um, half of our program, basically, because it's a translational program. So um, just wanted to declare some uh, relationships and uh, then just quickly cover what um, we leverage at 7T, but I have a feeling that the audience here has a good idea of what we're um, capable of doing at ultra high fields. Um, before I continue with this, I was wondering, uh, is there is there a um, Terra magnet at Johns Hopkins or what kind of 7T exists there at this time? Jun? Yeah, Peter may be more familiar. Uh, mainly we, uh, at the Kirby Center, we have uh, Philips 7T um, system. Okay. Okay, sorry, I, I was under the impression maybe it was a Siemens site. Okay, so uh, I don't know what uh, sort of work you've been sort of, you've been trying out with the Philips magnet, but I think some of the main advantages, which I'm going to show very quickly, are the entire high field community is very familiar with them. One is the increased signal to noise, which allows us to have very clear, uh, highly precise anatomical imaging. And uh, that allows us to segment smaller regions of the brain. Uh, here's just an image of T2 TSC at 7T with uh, 450 micron in plane resolution. We can go more, uh, uh, we can go a little further with that and have smaller in plane voxels. But that allows us to have very good differentiation between the gray and white matter and really zoom into structures such as the hippocampus, which is now being segmented for many different applications to try and understand if specific subnuclei in the hippocampus are experiencing volume loss or um, loss in architecture of those regions. And this is automatically done using uh, multiple different types of software, including FreeSurfer. We perform this for several different studies. This one is one from a major depressive disorder. Um, there's also the advantage of the fact that there's better background suppression of spins in techniques such as time of flight angiography and tinier arter arteries can be uh, visualized using time of flight and no contrast. Uh, time of flight uses the differentiation between flowing spins and stationary spins as its contrast. And clearly it's um, providing better images just out of the box for arteries than at lower or clinical field strengths. For the veins, we can leverage the paramagnetic blood in the, or the deoxygenated paramagnetic blood in the veins as a contrast mechanism. And so susceptibility weighted imaging allows us to see very tiny venules. Also any kind of venous abnormalities, which sometimes underlie cortical defects in cases such as epilepsy and also any kind of blood products or micro microbleeds. We can segment these vessels out. We can apply automated methods. And this is one that was developed by Rebecca Feldman, who is now uh, a, a professor in Canada at UBC. Um, she developed a segmentation method, an automated segmentation method for the veins, and then applied it to specific regions such as the hippocampus and amygdala and 
tested this out in epilepsy versus controls and saw abnormal vascularity in the hippocampus of um, epilepsy patients versus controls. For diffusion, it is possible to leverage the high signal to noise to have higher resolution diffusion maps. We found that between our 3T and 7T, um, even given some confounders in diffusion, we were able to achieve high resolution, higher resolution diffusion MRI and um, more precise tracking. And we were able to track, um, track uh, fibers coming from important structures. In this case is the amygdala isolated to the amygdala and then, and then isolated to specific Tr tracks, the fibers are isolated to specific tracks, such as the uncinate fasciculus and stria terminalis, um, all connecting to the amygdala. And we are also able to do a similar uh, technique with the hippocampus, where tracks uh, connecting to specific hippocampal subfields can be isolated as well. So the resolution and um, increased signal to noise at 7T can be leveraged for spectroscopy as well. Here we have reasonable SNR for spectroscopic voxels within um, regions of the hippocampus. So three different voxels in the head, body, tail of the hippocampus. So um, that is higher spatial resolution that ha than has been achieved in the past for spectroscopy and spectroscopy in particular benefits because it is an SNR starve, starved technique. So those are some of the things we can take advantage of. And then we can apply very um, advanced imaging methods and new, new uh, sequences and RF pulses in order to overcome some of the technical and physical limitations that may um, limit the contrast and resolution in certain parts of the brain. Um, before I get into the first clinical application, does anyone have any questions? I actually can't take a look at the chat window, so let me know. For some reason, it's not showing up. So let me know if something's showing up in the chat for me. Yeah, um, I can monitor that as well. Okay, so yeah. yeah, so I think uh, you know for uh, for today, um, uh, uh, feel free to uh, for the audience, feel free to ask questions either through the chat or the Q and A session. I monitor that. And, Great. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, uh, so because the pretty wants to make it a more interactive, which I think is a great uh, idea. So mm -hmm. we'll stop um, uh, maybe uh, after each um, you know uh, small section, and then we can have small uh, Q and A uh, uh, you know sessions uh, from the audience. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, I see one question. Um, uh, are there? I, I'm assuming there are different maps images for different sage groups for all these imaging modalities. Age groups. Age. <laughs> ah, okay. I was like, man, I'm a, have I been out of it for that long that I don't know what sage groups are. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I think uh, we are trying to find markers for aging actually uh, using structural segmentation and, and seeing whether or not there's such a thing as a brain age marker. Um, and uh, and, and uh, we've applied this to different data sets and to, including the healthy controls, but we're also working on Alzheimer's disease. So um, you are gonna see some atrophy as a natural aging occurs, but then there's um, ways to differentiate it with uh, late onset conditions such as Alzheimer's disease, uh, which is one of our uh, one of our clinical diseases that we work on. I'm not going to be presenting that today. Uh, what is the gradient set uh, on our 7T? It is um, oh, forgot the exact number, but I think it's 40 and 150 or. No, 80 and 150, basically. Um, and so it's close to, it's getting close to the uh, really high-end 3T scanners that exist for, um, uh, the gradients exist for doing brain imaging in particular. So our 7T has equivalent gradients to those, such as the Prisma Siemens scanner. And uh, it does not have a, a body coil. The transmit has to be uh, performed using 
the RF coil itself. So these are transmit and uh, receive coils, basically. Uh, having a body coil would be great, but uh, that is one of the things that doesn't exist at the 70 at this time. Great. Okay, so let me start with um, the 70 imaging for surgical resection of skull-based tumors. And um, we basically saw an opportunity to use 7T to help better guide neurosurgery. And I was introduced to the, to the specific uh, need in skull-based lesions through a neurosurgery collaborator, a neurosurgeon collaborator, who has since collaborated with our team on several different projects. His name is Raj Srivastava. And um, basically there are lesions of the skull base that can be accessed through um, different approaches, including a endoscopic endonasal approach. And these lesions, and they're listed here, all the different types of lesions that can occur from different tissues in that area, um, pituitary adenomas, meningiomas, craniopharyngiomas, they actually consist of a large portion of all intracranial tumors. They are often aren't malignant, but they have symptoms that uh, can cause uh, uh, compressive symptoms that occur in the brain. One of the main compressive symptoms is vision loss as it's compressing against important nerves associated with vision, but there's facial pain and numbness and headaches. These um, uh, lesions are uh, mostly not aggressive, but because of these symptoms, it's, it's um, important to uh, re remove them from the brain. However, their location is, is close to delicate structures, including those nerves that they compress against and arteries. And um, because of their location and the complexity of the surgery, historically, these surgeries have been, been sort of posing a lot of challenges. And um, in order to have a surgery that has the least recovery time, shorter hospital stay, and uh, least trauma, we can actually perform a minimally invasive, or the surgeons can perform a minimally invasive procedure um, called endo endoscopic endonasal surgery, in which an uh, endoscope is inserted through the nasal cavity and um, and the region that needs to be resected is illuminated with um, a light, and uh, there's a camera at the end of the of the endoscope, and the surgical instruments are inserted along with it, and and all the drilling is performed in this way without any skin is incision or um, an open craniotomy. This kind of procedure requires very good image guidance. So essentially. Um, neurosurgeons synthesize images from the endoscope, which is shown right in front uh, in the middle, and also co-registered images to MRI, um, where the instruments have um, are they're, they're tracked using infrared markers, and these infrared markers are placed on bony anatomy, and then the CT scan of the bony anatomy is co-registered with the MRI, and there's a neuro navigation screen that allows the um, visualization of the location of these instruments. Now that MRI scan um, needs to depict in great detail the tiny, tiny arteries and tiny nerves that are in the vicinity of these tumors or pushing against these tumors or the tumors are pushing against them. And um, because if there is any um, damage to these structures, that, that would be cataclysmic, there would be uh, very high complications. Um, the surgeries are very um, uh, long and and anything to improve the decision-making and to make it so that there's safe, um, safe sur surgery and safe, um, safe uh, decisions that are being made um, can really help the neurosurgeons and increase the confidence of the uh, surgical decision-making. So anyway, you see here, 
the operating suite and um, the MRIs projected on the right there. What we have done is we have um, basically performed multimodal seven Tesla MRI in order to, and by multimodal, I mean multi-contrast, in order to depict all of the important structures in greater detail and then project this on the neuro navigation system. Um, Prior to the uh, to the operating room procedure, there's also a lot of planning that is done using the MRI and having a good idea of the geometric location of these structures and exactly how they are being uh, compressed is really important for safe uh, and and um, high confidence surgical decision making. So here you see on the left a uh, ma macroadenoma, a pituitary macroadenoma, and uh, uh, tiny subtle features such as tumor heterogeneity uh, between firm and soft areas and uh, vasculature that's uh, like dr draining veins or arteries that are um, encased in the tumor, as well as um, structures such as mammillary bodies that are compressed around the side of the tumor are visualized at 7T but poorly visualized at lower field strengths. And we have multiple different contrasts. So we do perform time of flight angiography that allows for the uh, visualization of surrounding arteries. This is important for the specific application to see the arteries around the, the tumor. And here's another example with a meningioma and the arteries are uh, illuminated using time of flight angiography with the heat map and overlaid on the meningioma, which is which is um, indicated with this asterisk. And this is helpful in surgical decision making, a lot more helpful than um, just looking at the clinical clinical scans and and not really sort of doing targeted preoperative uh, scanning, but also leveraging the high resolution that's possible with 7Tesla. So just to be systematic about it, we decided that we needed to, first of all, come up with a quantitative scheme to determine whether or not there's a benefit and advantage. Any Anytime you're introducing a new tool into the operating room, um, you need to come up with a quantitative metric to try and understand the actual improvement that this tool is, is providing. And for, um, for that, we basically devised um, a scheme to determine the whether or not the detectability of these nerves and vessels is actually um, improved. And when we compared it to the clinical scans at either three Tesla or 1.5 Tesla, um, it was found that there is improved visualization of uh, important cranial nerves as well as um, intracranial arteries, including the ophthalmic artery. And um, this, this work was published. Beyond actual utility of improving neurosurgical planning and guidance, we also felt that it was good to leverage the high resolution and improved contrast at 7 Tesla to understand any downstream effects of these surgical, um, of, of the, of the uh, tumor itself and then improvements post-surgery. Um, one of the main uh, systems that's affected by these, by these different tumors in the skull base is the optic system or the optic apparatus. And for that, there are several different quantitative metrics that can be derived to try and understand whether there's any kind of damage happening to them. So the immediate damage is to the optic chiasm, and that can also be um, quantified by, by segmenting it out. But beyond that, uh, we wanted to determine whether or not long-term effects of these tumors have resulted in any kind of atrophy in the visual cortex or in the um, optic radiations. Um, and it was actually found through our diffusion imaging uh, that there is some uh, change in the fractional anisotropy and the mean diffusivity for the optic tracks that um, we basically uh, took the average values across the track starting at the uh, chiasm and, and ending at the LGN. Um, so different segments of this um, optic apparatus. And the blue is um, for controls and the red is for patients. And we found increased fractional anisotropy 
or decreased fractional anisotropy for the patients along these tracks and increased um, mean diffusivity in uh, some cases. So um, there is some indication of potential damage to the vi visual apparatus. Okay, so I'm gonna take a look at the questions. That, that's, that's our work on skull-based lesions. What novel questions can we ask and also answer about functional connectivity networks with high resolution at 70 imaging techniques? Yeah, so um, I, I don't know if I'm covering any of our functional work here, but we basically are able to get much higher resolution with the functional MRI. And we've been able to go down to 1.5 millimeters isotropic. Um, we can go to one millimeter, but it's a it's a longer, a little bit longer scan. But within a reasonable amount of time, so just uh, nine to ten minutes, we can go to 1.5 millimeters isotropic. And bold really does benefit from the increased signal to noise, and um, the bold contrast is enhanced as well. Um, so um, we're able to then. First of all, do what we were doing earlier, segment tinier regions and create functional connectivity maps from those tinier regions and look at the correlations between those. And then we then do network analysis where the network nodes are based in things like the hippocampal subnuclei or subfields and um, thalamic subnuclei, for example. So connectivity matrices can be made with a higher resolution, um, I guess, um, overall connection points. And, and uh, when it comes to task-based fMRI, it also benefits because um, there's just increased bold contrast. And so you get greater certainty of your measure, basically, your contrast and noise increases. Um, at some point, you reach, reach kind of a physical limit for how higher resolution you can go with functional MRI because the underlying uh, physiological effect, which is the hemodynamic uh, response, um, it will have a certain physical limit on how punctate it can be or how uh, coupled it is with the underlying neuronal activity, basically. But we can go down to things like one millimeter isotropic for that. And also how might functional connectivity research and clinical diagnosis. So we do use functional connectivity to understand um, effects of different interventions. Um, so um, anytime we're looking at a therapeutic in intervention, um, we'll look at pre and post functional connectivity. It's something that is overall allowing us to determine the current neural state. Um, and for, for epilepsy, we want to avoid uh, important functional networks when performing surgical resection um, or when using minimally invasive methods such as electrode stimulation. Um, it's really good to know what where the functional networks are. And a lot of times limbic structures that I was talking about earlier are heavily involved in the pathophysiology of these illnesses, including the thala thalamus for epilepsy. So understanding its functional connectivity, maybe on a more granular scale with the th th thalamic subnuclei can actually help in, um, in treatment planning. And we hope to do that in a very systematic way in the next uh, few years, because we established that epilepsy foci, uh, the epileptogenic focus or the area that results in the seizure is better visualized using seven Tesla and detectable using seven Tesla versus lower field strengths. But now we wanna take it to the next step where we look at epilepsy as a functional disease. I, I mean, sorry, as a network, as a network disease, which it is, uh, where there are abnormal networks that are basically resulting in seizures and hyperconnectivity. And we wanna basically leverage the more functional imaging to help with treatment planning. I hope that answered those questions. Um, okay, so I wanted to go to another disease in the skull base that we found 7T was very helpful to um, better diagnose and also potentially treat. Uh, it's a rare disease called trigeminal neuralgia, and it is... Um, it is resulting from some sort of abnormality associated with the trigeminal nerve, which uh, innervates the face. And um, 
in the past, it's been referred to as the suicide disease because it is so incredibly painful. It's one of the most painful diseases that exists and um, often misdiagnosed and often misunderstood because it can result from several different etiologies. We haven't pinned down the etiology of it uh, just as yet. One of the main things that people do feel um, some like could result in in relief is is undoing something called neurovascular compression or using neurovascular decompression surgery and that is when a vessel is identified as impinging on the trigeminal nerve now the trigeminal nerve uh, you can see visualized entering meckel's cave into the brain stem um, in this artist's depiction on the right, and then also at seven, Tesla nicely visualized. Um, and sometimes there's a vessel that is uh, next to the nerve and is um, causing uh, mechanical compression and damaging the nerve. And this actually could be a potential etiology and it's often identified. Um, but it's often identified and, and uh, the surgical uh, care for it, the treatment for it doesn't um, doesn't completely relieve symptoms or the symptoms return. Um, so there are multiple different things that could be leading to it, including um, a disease or like what, a demyelination disease, such as multiple sclerosis, a, a tumor that may be impinging on the nerve, um, injury to the face and um, different types of sinal and dental syndromes. So just having a better understanding of the overall um, I guess, uh, uh, involvement of different anatomy and a more comprehensive understanding of the, of the etiology for, and also a more sort of customized, uh, personalized sort of imaging um, um, protocol for this is valuable and could mean the difference between living with in immense pain and, and living with relief, basically. Um, and uh, understanding the whole uh, trigeminal pathway, the pain pathway, it's actually useful for all types of pain, uh, neuropathic pain, as well as uh, different types of syndromes such as uh, migraine and, and headaches. And, um, and we can visualize this very nicely at 7 Tesla, just to show you what we're trying to focus on. We want to look at the spinal trigeminal nucleus, the trigeminal ganglion, and the trigeminal nerve. Um, these connect to the thalamus, which is another important structure that we study in many different diseases, and its connection to the somatosensory cortex and how pain is is uh, processed and and uh, and pain itself is rooted in maybe the trigeminal nerve or ganglion or some sort of abnormality there, but then the, the entire pain pathway is involved in the, in the sensation of pain, basically. Um, all of these structures can be studied in greater detail when we apply multiple contrasts at high resolution. And um, as you can see here, one study we performed um, uh, on looking at the trigeminal, um, looking at the thalamus and its connections to the somatosensory cortex in trigeminal neuralgia patients versus um, versus healthy controls and between the affected and non-affected side uh, performed by Jack Rutland. Um, abnormality was observed in the affected side, ipsilateral to the affected side for the trigeminal neuralgia patients versus controls. And uh, this was uh, this was published now. Usually with trigeminal neuralgia, we don't actually uh, study these downstream or the entire network. And here there was benefit in doing that to further our understanding of the disease. Um, we're still sort of just scratching the surface. Um, one of the main uh, things we can do for this, given the high resolution seven Tesla, is look at the cross-sectional area of the of the different nerve segments, and also use those 
as ROIs for performing diffusion and fractional inotropy and then tracking the nerve segments. And this is performed by Judy Alper in my lab. Um, she actually found that in our trigeminal neuralgia patients, we've only scanned 13 and, and compared them to 13 controls. This is an ongoing study. Um, that the cross-sectional nerve of the uh, posterior cisternal segment of the nerve was indeed um, smaller on the ipsilateral side of pain for trigeminal neuralgia patients. And interestingly, thalamic subnuclei were overall larger. Um, and all of these uh, findings are just, again, clues to try and come up with a better understanding of the etiology of this disease. So this work is currently funded and we are working on um, applying all of these tools in order to, to unravel the etiology of trigeminal neuralgia. Any questions? I don't see any in the chat right now. So I'll move on to 7T imaging and the treatment of drug-resistant epilepsy. Um, this project has been go ongoing for a while. Um, it was the first clinical application that we explored with uh, Seven Tesla, and it was a good it was a good match for Seven Tesla because um, many cases in epilepsy. Um, first of all, many people suffer from epilepsy, which is uh, which is a disease in which there are recurrent seizures. And 40% um, for, oh, of these patients are resistant to um, anti-seizure drugs. And um, this basically is a debilitating disease if, if uh, you're not able to control it. Um, it accounts for 80% of the cost of epilepsy is the patients who are uh, drug resistant. In the drug resistant epilepsy patients, there are options for surgical treatment if an abnormality is identified in the brain, um, which may be acting as the source of seizure or is somehow involved in seizure propagation, then um, surgical options such as uh, resective surgery, um, minimally invasive options, including responsive neurostimulation, deep brain stimulation, and uh, laser ablation exist. Uh, these can benefit from having a better understanding of the networks that are involved. Um, MRI is crucial when it comes to determining if patients are surgical candidates, in addition to the clinical workup, which includes a um, scalp EEG. And um, anytime there's a clear abnormality that's identified on an MRI, it really results in better outcomes for these patients and can actually be the difference between um, living with seizures and seizure freedom. Um, so a non-invasive additional diagnostic measure such as a seven Tesla used in the right way could be life-changing for patients. And so it is a very um, well-matched uh, clinical application for the advantages of seven Tesla. As I said earlier, there are many different outcomes for epilepsy patients. One is they may be um, uh, responding to drugs, which would help them manage their epilepsy. If they are not able to, if they are in the drug resistant epilepsy uh, set, there is um, a option for them to, to um, basically undergo epilepsy surgery, but in order to do that, there has to be a clear finding in the clinical workup of which the MRI scan is a key piece. If uh, they're exhibiting focal seizures and have a negative M MRI scan or, or non-lesional on MRI, but it's clear from the EEG and other clinical workup that in there's a suspected seizure onset zone or area of the brain that is highly involved in this seizure, then they are potential surgical candidates. And in that case, um, an additional measure such as the seven Tesla scan could be quite helpful in their treatment planning. And so we have actually performed um, uh, already a, a study on on patients that are non-lesional at seven tests, a uh, non-lesional in their clinical scans and have focal epilepsy. 
Uh, bifocal epilepsy, I mean, it's not generalized. It has a clear um, area from the brain in which the seizure um, originates. The techniques that are helpful in epilepsy to, um, to detect the focus, but also try and understand what regions are involved um, are the anatomical methods, the high resolution T1, the high resolution T2, uh, often the it's a it's a gray matter disease, so you're looking for cortical abnormalities, subtle things like um, like focal cortical dysplasias, any kind of defects. Um, hippocampus is often involved. There's a medial temporal epilepsy in which you're looking for hippocampal abnormalities, and those hippocampal subfields could co could come in handy in trying to understand quantitative metrics of whether or not a hippocampus is actually abnormal in this patient or asymmetrical. Um, susceptibility rated imaging turned out to be quite useful in order to see vascular abnormalities that were coincident with the cortical defects. And spectroscopy is valuable in determining neuronal loss, um, which may not be anatomically detectable yet, but um, cell loss is occurring and cell function loss is occurring. And diffusion and resting state, uh, diffusion MRI and resting state fMRI, as we spoke about earlier, um, really help you get a sense of whether there's abnormal connectivity or seizure networks and which nodes in these networks could be targeted for, um, for surgical uh, treatment and intervention. Uh, as a start, we basically, performed 7T imaging on um, MRI negative patients, patients who have previously been, uh, had a 1.5 or 3 Tesla scan and there were no lesions found. And we um, did a full epilepsy um, protocol on them, which included the T1, T2, and uh, diffusion on, on a subset of them, as well as susceptibility weighted imaging and flare. And we, we found that um, abnormalities within the hippocampus, for example, were, were detected at 7T and they had gone undetected at the clinical field strength. Um, so uh, SWI happened to sometimes detect a coincident abnormality. Here's a, a hippocampal abnormality where it's um, clear that uh, there's some hippocampal atrophy in the left hippocampus, and uh, it's coincident with a cavernoma that was detected on SWI. Some subtle um, abnormalities such as this cortical defect, which is a polymicrogyria or something that looks like a, has a cauliflower appearance, was uh, detected at 7T while um, went overlooked at 3T. Uh, this this dysplasia was detected at 70 uh, and and actually ended up uh, resulting in after uh, after having cl clinical standard of care validation um, resulting in seizure um, relief for this patient. Um, overall, just to get an overall picture, the number of abnormalities which are, indicated in dark blue here for unblinded reads. Um, unblinded meaning there was no knowledge of whether this was a control or a patient basically when doing the read. And we did perform the entire protocol on matched controls as well. So um, we found greater number of hippocampal abnormalities and cortical abnormalities and vascular abnormalities in, in patients versus age and gender matched controls. Because we wanted to make sure that we weren't detecting something that was above the level of or threshold of detectability, but not clinically significant. Um, one of the things that was used to determine clinical significance was obviously review by the clinicians to determine whether or not this would be involved in epilepsy pathophysiology. But we also did this controlled match thing so that we could uh, determine the categories of abnormalities that happen to be existing in both patients and controls. Um, an additional, um, sorry, a blinded read and then an unblinded read. What I meant to say blinded read was with uh, no knowledge of controller patients. And the unblinded read occurred after the blinded read by the radiologist to, to again, look at it with a closer eye and, and determine whether or not um, certain regions of the brain that 
were coincident with the suspected seizure onset zone were abnormal. Um, so this is kind of showing you overall that we did see greater number of abnormalities in non-lesional patients. These are patients who were normal MRI scans at, at 3 and 1.5 T, and that many of these abnormalities are clinically significant, including the hippocampal and cortical abnormalities compared to controls. Again, this work was published and 15 of these led to localized, uh, were 15 of the abnormalities that were detected in 37 patients were localized to the suspected seizure onset zone. We also found that many of these patients now, uh, when they were surgical candidates, their um, imaging findings, their 70 imaging findings, um, resulted in seizure freedom at higher rates of 57.1% than patients with non-definite lesion status. Again, we, we published that work on the effect of these findings once validated with clinical standard of care um, on surgical care, basically, and surgical success. When we wanted to look at uh, that, that's us looking at how 7T can actually make a difference in the care of individual patients. But we also want to look at epilepsy pathophysiology and essentially how can 7T and just smarter imaging allow us to understand how epilepsy affects the brain in general. Um, we can do hippocampal subfield volumetrics and we've applied that to our epilepsy data set. We found that the um, Patients with what's called medial temporal lobe epilepsy, that's the epilepsy that affects that uh, part of the brain, um, indeed had uh, very different values for um, their um, CA1, CA2, 3, and DG subfields. Um, and this is after having that epilepsy for more than 10 years. So it's a, it's a long-term effect. And what we're plotting here is asymmetry between the two sides of the hippocampus. And it's a good way to understand what's going on because it's kind of like a within subject normalization. And you want to determine whether or not the side with the seizures is looking different than the side without, because these seizures are lateralized basically. So there is a greater asymmetry for patients with um, medial temporal epilepsy that has a duration of greater than 10 years. And it's significantly different. And this is just from volumetrics and not from qualitative assessment. The other thing we found, and we've pioneered this technique, as I showed earlier in the general 70 slides, um, tracking fibers that are connecting to specifically a specific hippocampal subfield. And um, interestingly, some subfields were showing um, uh, uh, I think uh, hyperconnectivity on the ipsilateral side and sub, some fields were showing reduced connectivity on the contralateral side. Um, and, uh, and I can go into details on this finding later, but uh, overall there were abnormal um, connected, there was abnormal con connectivity uh, uh, detected through um, metrics such as the um, streamline count, the number of streamlines uh, connecting that specific um, hippocampal subfield, but then also the fractional anisotropy and the MD values average along those tracks. Mm -hmm. So there are multiple diffusion metrics that were used in a quantitative manner to determine the, if there was something different, both on the ipsilateral and contralateral side of patients, and then versus controls also published work. And uh, the other sort of epilepsy biomarker that we thought was uh, an interesting finding um, for qualitative um, assessments, because we did obviously very detailed qualitative reads on all of these, our radiologist uh, collaborator, Dr. Delman, found that there seemed to be more numerous perivascular spaces, which are tiny fluid-filled spaces in the um, white matter surrounding vessels. And these seem to be more sort of uh, like asymmetric in, in the patients versus the controls. So we have since per uh, performed this perivascular space detection 
uh, in an automated fashion, we've come up with an automated segmentation method for that. But prior to that, it was a manual segmentation, which is shown here, or manual detection, where we have uh, lines indicating the size of the of the perivascular space is a very painstaking task, but um, we did find quantitatively that there um, was greater asymmetry and, and uh, density of these perivascular spaces in epilepsy versus control. And since then, we've started to realize that this is a powerful surrogate marker for inflammation and inflammatory processes. And um, epilepsy will probably have several different effects on brain tissue, including uh, inflammatory effects. And um, we also perform 7T imaging and multi-contrast imaging on understanding abnormalities associated with COVID-19. And um, we basically started this work as soon as the pandemic um, hit, and we realized that neurological manifestations were occurring of COVID-19. And uh, there's a publication on PVSs and how they are different in the uh, COVID-19 uh, neurological, uh, people with long haul COVID versus not. Have there been any studies using task-based fMRI on 17 patients with epilepsy? Yes, not in our lab, but that is definitely something that you'll find multiple publications on. You'll probably find now 70 publications on that as well. Um, task-based fMRI, again, as I said, helps um, actually in surgical decision-making so that you can either target or avoid certain important neurological, uh, like uh, networks and associated with important neural functions. Um, and, uh, and I think that fMRI can also help understand the role of certain limbic structures, such as the thalamus in epilepsy. Uh, often the thalamus is targeted in um, DBS and um, and RNS, and it does it is one of the main hubs of the brain when it comes to neural activity, and has an effect on uh, mitigating seizures. Um, but the question is why and how, and so fMRI uh, studies can be helpful towards that. We do resting state fMRI. Um, we started doing that in our epilepsy data set. Um, but not task-based at this time. Any other questions on the epilepsy work? Yeah, I, I want to ask a question if you don't mind. No I problem. Saw the, <laughs> I saw the perivascular space results are really interesting. Uh, you see this asymmetry. Um, I saw you said it's it may be related to uh, to neural inflammation. Um, so. I was wondering, you know, what's your thought? Because in recent years we talk about those lymphatic lymphatic system seems to uh, associated with the clearance um, of yeah. you mm -hmm. know, from the that's brain. the link yeah. that we're basically oh. studying, and right. that's the link that we're basically studying, and and essentially, it is impaired clearance of the uh, G lymphatic system that we're trying to target essentially. But there could be other reasons why they inflame too. Um, again, the exact reason why they're more numerous or large is one is that, one could be that. And the other one could be that just the surrounding white matter is, is uh, there's atrophy or something. So there's more space for them to expand, you know? Um, so, um, and, and in, in some cases, you'd expect there to be more of them if that is the case, if it's atrophy of the white matter, but there's actually um, the opposing effect, you know? And, and so I think just more work is required to fully validate the link between PVSs and the, and the underlying changes in the tissue, basically, and the G lymphatic system and clearance associated with that. And we've been studying it where sleep and, cause you know, sleep is also associated with the clearance um, and of the lymphatic clearance. And, 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 and then it's also associated with um, AD path, uh, like um, Alzheimer's disease pathophysiology, right? The, the, the sleep has been linked to that and then it's been linked to the clearance. Um, so there's a real key there to basically try and maybe leverage this uh, powerful marker, you know, that could help track therapeutic interventions, for example, or better um, sleep and circadian rhythm. So we're funded for a project 
where we actually use seven Tesla to understand the effect of some uh, of, of, of light therapy, therapy where you basically have a certain frequency of light in your surroundings and your environment in order to better, uh, in order to um, basically uh, regulate your circadian rhythms and sleep. And then it helps with cognition and it's been known to do that. It's just that we don't know what's going on in the brain that helps to do that, basically. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. it's a very interesting result. So yeah. Especially, especially the asymmetry part. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for that. Absolutely. No problem. Let's see. We've got another question. Could you speculate about the healthy controls who have higher perivascular space asymmetry? Might they have some undetected or silent pathology? That's a very interesting question. I think a lot of times you have to be careful about looking at, first of all, things on markers on an individual diagnostic level, especially something like this. Um, and and um, I think that there's some numer numerous, uh, I guess, processes by which these um, perivascular spaces could look different. A lot of times you'll see a lot of white matter hyper intensities, or you'll see um, you know, a lot of, um, of, uh, I guess, I guess large ventricles or something in a person and they have zero, like it has a zero effect on their neurological functioning, you know, and, um, and, and there's a, a lot, numerous findings that are above the threshold of detectability. Yes. On a group level, sometimes we are detecting these differences, but I think there's caution to be, uh, exercised when looking at it in any way as individual diagnostic marker, uh, unless it's a mass lesion and you definitely need to intervene. Um, the brain has its own sort of, in many ways, like it, it's near, it's very plastic and it, and it, and it basically ha uh, changes and, and adapts to a lot of different things. And um, I, can't answer that question basically <laughs> it's an it's an unknown the an the answer is unknown but i wouldn't worry about it if you have a lot of perivascular spaces <laughs> we haven't found anything yet that's like a silent pathology associated with that but good question and it's good to speculate on this stuff once in a while it might drive you crazy but you know Good to speculate on. <laughs> okay, so um, I'll go on to the neurobiology of depression. Now, this is a very different track entirely because I've been talking about using uh, seven Tesla and imaging, which it often is for, used in a very uh, direct way on actual surgical treatment and and essentially like avoiding or targeting certain areas of the brain. And uh, what we also think is a powerful application for high resolution granular sort of quantitative imaging is understanding the um, pathophysiology of diseases that are uh, are neurologically occult or sorry neuro occult in neuroimaging so neuroimaging is not traditionally used in any way for diagnosis or treatment for psychiatric illness, but we do know that there's something different in the biology that is um, resulting in some of these illnesses. Um, the uh, illnesses have heterogeneous symptoms and, um, and understanding the basis of each and one of each and every one of these symptoms and how they interlink with each other, but also overlap with some other neurological diseases um, would be really helpful instead of basically, um, you know, uh, using first line therapies on everyone and not understanding the specificity of each case. So for more personalized sort of understanding of what's happening in psychiatric illness, it's good to have a sense of the neurobiology of the disease in, in general. And um, non-invasive high resolution imaging is the best way to better understand. Now, depression, as we know, has a, a great effect on the population. It, it's one of the most debilitating um, uh, illnesses. It's, it's becoming more and more of a problem in every age group. And, um, and we don't have a full understanding of the pathophysiology of depression. Um, there are multiple different factors that may lead to the to the 
uh, symptoms that we experience. Uh, the symptoms are heterogeneous, like I said, or or they're multi faceted, there's sleep disorders, uh, uh, there's effect on the ability to experience pleasure or also called anhedonia. Um, there's something called lassitude, which is the um, inability to, um, uh, I guess, want to do anything. And, um, and, uh, uh, and, multiple other um, multiple other facets, just overall anxiety, high anxiety, they're all interrelated. Mood and anxiety disorders have a lot of overlap in their symptoms. And um, if we can find the underlying circuits and uh, different sort of um, markers that could that could be linked more tightly, to the individual symptom measures or the dimensions of depression as um, the uh, community wants to establish, uh, then we would have more powerful treatments, basically more personalized and targeted treatments. Um, so there are multiple different reasons why depression arises. There is a, a set of different um, potential um, sources of the abnormalities and they're listed here on the left. And how they affect the brain is just through different um, mechanisms, including um, neurotoxic effects on um, cells in different parts of the brain, including uh, a very sensitive area, such as the hippocampus, um, strength of neural connections, affecting the strength of neuro neural connections, affecting neurotransmission in, in some cases and uh, reducing uh, neurogenesis, which is in some parts of the brain thought to occur. Um, and and um, these can be basically isolated to quantitative metrics, which I've talked about earlier that are possible at 70, uh, or those quantitative metrics can um, provide a window into what's happening in that specific uh, uh, I guess, region and, and effect on the brain, on the brain tissue. And that includes hippocampal subfield volumetrics, structural changes all overall in the brain, but also reduced connectivity or, or um, diffusion metrics that I talked about earlier, the quantitative metrics. We can also use spectroscopy. I haven't shown any results of that, but it's helpful in understanding um, cellular changes in underlying the structural changes. And uh, sometimes we can look at neurotransmitters using spectroscopy. So we're building techniques to better detect things like uh, GABA and, and glutamine and glutamine. But these are the imaging techniques that link to all of these different quantitative metrics. So this this diagram kind of um, is a one uh, is a start in trying to understand depression basically using imaging. So we have to throw the entire battery of tests on, on this specific disease because um, it is one of those things which will be more data-driven than mechanistic. And um, because we do want to try and understand all of these different potential um, pathways by which depression affects the brain. Uh, we'd look at the, um, the overall... Um, uh, the volumetric measure measurements, which are which are possible to do at very high accuracy at seven Tesla, but then also we look at the hippocampal subfields, like I talked about earlier. We can look at amygdala subnuclei, another region of the brain that's heavily involved, and uh, we can look at spectroscopy, but also overall connectivity and network measures, which I haven't talked about. But we do do graph theory and network theory, and and find. Um, that there are actual quantitative differences in graph theory. This is just a volumetric uh, finding here where we're finding reduced volumetrics of amygdala subnuclei, um, specifically the right nuclei on the right side uh, seem to dominate, but there's some loss of volume in the left side too, which is interesting. And this is with uh, depression um, severity as measured, uh, we're looking at the correlation with depression severity as measured through a score called the Madras score. Um, and it is one, it is one way to quantify the depression severity. Um, as, as I talked about earlier, we can do volumetrics of the hippocampus. It's an ongoing um, study we found actually, I haven't uh, put the results on here, but um, 
Judy Alper in our lab found there was a correlation with the specific symptom measure associated with stress. And this has actually been submitted for publication. And, um, and we did the hippocampal connectivity measurements like I talked about earlier. And we found that the output gate of the hippocampus, the fimbriae, mm -hmm. were particularly abnormal in MDD patients versus controls. The dentate gyrus, which is um, which is also an important subfield, and I believe is um, linked to neurogenesis or one of the areas in the brain that there could be neurogenesis, had a different uh, had an abnormal finding versus controlled. And this is again the connectivity of these subfields versus the subfield volume. So we look at the volumes and the connectivity. Um, in a quantitative way. And I think I'm not really well describing these images. These images are, are showing um, fiber tracks from the entire hippocampus shown in part B, and then in D from a specific subfield, in this case, the uh, um, I believe the DG. And um, and then on the right, the whole hippocampus with those those tracks subtracted. So you'll see them in white here. So you can, you can have a specific measures from specific subfields, basically. That's the important point here. And from the whole hippocampus. Uh, we can look at the amygdala like I showed earlier. And this is tracks emerging from the entire amygdala, but we've also isolated the tracks to uh, known, um, known fiber tracks in the brain, including the uncinate fasciculus and uh, stria terminalis, which are something that we felt would be mechanistically involved in anxiety and, and depression because the uncinate connects the limbic structures to the frontal lobe. And it's one of the main tracks that does that. And limbic structures are involved in um, the um, uh, entire uh, process of, of, of anxious thought and, and uh, all of the, all of the different areas that are, that are linked to the, um, or the the different symptoms that are linked to depression, but and then the frontal lobe is involved in uh, in basically processing those those impulses, and so they say that the connectivity between the frontal areas and the limbic areas are key to depression pathophysiology, um, and um, it's important to study those. So we also can isolate the tracks associated with specific amygdala subnuclei as we do with the subfields of the hippocampus. And again, in this published work, we found that there is actual difference in streamline count, which is a, a measure for like a quantitative measure for how connected these areas are um, in many of the right amygdala nuclei, um, specifically subnuclei compared to control. So they seem to be hyper-connected in this case, which is an interesting finding. Okay, that's just a few things in depression. Um, that we have some other um, publications on this, where we're again looking for de depression markers, and our current work is actually focused on taking all of these findings and using machine learning approaches to try and come up with depression subtypes. Basically, are we seeing any clustering of these um, of these patients? according to their neuroimaging findings specifically, and whether or not they actually coincide with specific depression subtypes associated with, um, let's say, hang, high anxiety, high anhedonia, uh, or high rumination, high, uh, low anhedonia, or something like that. Are there um, symptom-based types of depression? instead of just one overall umbrella term depression basically and that are those are those distinctly uh different in the multidimensional space we're studying them and that's with the um with the structural imaging findings basically um so yeah any questions with this uh part of the talk And I didn't cover network theory. Uh, there are some publications you can look up. Uh, I think the main scientist there would be Yael Jacob. And she has looked at changes in, in graph theory metrics and network theory associated with depression and associated with specific symptoms of depression, including rumination. 
Okay, so I just wanted to thank um, my team and uh, all of this work is their work basically. Um, and my collaborators and my funding sources. Um, this is a, just a, a overview of some of the stuff. I would be happy to go deeper into any of the specific topics. And there are other diseases that we're studying that I haven't covered. And I talked about them, I touched upon them. There's COVID-19, there's, there's Alzheimer's disease that we've been working on and we've been applying different things to that, including MR elastography to try and understand brain stiffness. So, um, you know, happy to discuss any of it. Let me know. Yeah, great. Thanks so much, Pretty. I, 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 you know, it's, it's exciting to see um, so many applications. And it looks like your 70s is really busy. Uh, you have so yeah. many things going on in the 70s. So that's great. Yeah, we just got a Prisma now. Um, right. So we're going to use that too. And we're going to have a very good sort of standard to, con to, to compare against. Because prior to that, we had um, 3T magnet that was a little bit more geared towards body imaging than brain imaging. Um, but now we can have a one-on-one -on -one comparison that's really sort of, because in many cases, the 70 does allow you to have a highly precise um, view into what's going on, but um, it does suffer from physical limitations that I talked about earlier. And if we can do some of the work at three Tesla with the higher spatial coverage, with just a really good gradient set and then do a little bit more of the focused ROI type work with seven Tesla. I think that's a really excellent combination, but of course it requires two different scanners, two different uh, scans. Oh yeah, that's a great point. I was actually gonna ask a related question. Uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, just to the audience, everybody, uh, we are having the uh, Q and A session now. Uh, if you have additional questions, feel free to put it in Q and A or chat box. So I, I, I have a sort of a, a, a more general question, um, you know, which sort of comes up to me, you know, comes up to um, every, every, almost every time I attend, a, a, you know, a, a, a seminar like this application on 17. You know, I, I think, you know, um, from lots of studies, including, you know, the, uh, the, the results you just show, 70, at least for some of the application shows clear advantage. Right, the epilepsy uh, lesion detection, I think, is a clear example. Um, so it, it looks like uh, that we are in a sort of a period, that, especially after Terra is approved for, uh, uh, you know, by uh, you know FDA, and we are you know, sort of we are moving uh, slowly towards for some of the application from three T to seven T. However, most of study is still conduct on seven on three T, or like you said, a combination of the two. So as a, I was wondering what what uh, uh, kind of barriers, um, you know, if any, did you have to, you know, overcome in order to get, uh, in, especially investigators who used to scan on 3T or 7T, you know, wants to actually move to 7T in order to take advantage of these uh, more advanced technologies? Yeah, I, I mean, honestly, the clinicians were eager to try something um, new because, in many cases, including the epilepsy cases, um, their patients were basically looking for any new information that could help them gain relief or or overcome their disease, you know. And um, and it just so happens that even though three T is great, it is missing some stuff. It's missing some stuff, and I think it would be unreasonable, like non-feasible when it comes to some of doing some of these granular quantifications or volumes. Um, and, and so I think that there is an actual clinical need that drove uh, these studies, you know, and um, when uh, basically addressing some of the concerns of like reviewers, NIH reviewers, for example, who are like, why do we need this? Uh, and also, will it be as readily available as 3T? Um, it's safe. It's it's going to be uh, more and more widely available at all of the major centers. It has been, it has received uh, 510K approval and it acts as an additional diagnostic measure 
that is non-invasive and truly provides a more precise and high resolution picture of what is going on. If I was a patient, I would want that, you know, and I would want a safer surgical plan because a lot of times um, surgical plans are made on whatever information is at hand. And, um, and you have to just, you have to, in some case, um, do a little bit of guesswork on, on what would be the best course of action. Any additional information can help um, increase the, increase the precision of the, of the plan and, and uh, improve your prognosis. So I think that to me, it's a no brainer because it's a non-invasive 1.25 hour um, multimodal sort of, uh, I guess, um, uh, it's a one visit type thing where you get multiple pieces of information about your brain and, um, and, and, and it's not that like, it's a pretty like easy experience for the patient. Like there's no contrast or anything in most of these cases. In the case of skull base, we do use the contrast because it's part of the main neurological protocol. But I see the, I see, I see a tremendous clinical advantage basically to add the 70. And I don't think as of yet, it makes sense to replace the clinical scan with it. But I think we're going to get to that point where we feel comfortable enough with the hardware and the, and the new sequences that we can have a pretty complete 70 protocol and it can provide the main er, types of contrast that n- neuroradiologists are used to seeing, you know, plus additional contrasts and, um, and provide these patients with a pathway forward, you know, so they don't have to live with their symptoms. We have patients who, who reach out to us actually, who read our papers and are like, for example, the trigeminal oh, okay. patients. Yeah. Right. Who are like, you know, I've been, I've been basically suffering from this my whole life. And I, I, I would like to just basically participate in your study so I can um, see what's going on. And, um, and so like, I always feel good about that, that I'm working on something that's needed. And I'm not just trying to impose the 70 because it's a bigger, badder magnet, basically. Right. Right. You should you you should probably include those letters to your uh, your (laughs) grant application or something. Tell me, in in terms of that, my my personal feeling is that maybe you know five ten years ago, we write a seventy grant, you always get a question why seventy. But nowadays, in recent years, I get less and less such questions. I think the reviewers are more and more start to realize for certain applications, seventy does have. Yeah, and and we are constantly trying to make it. the kind of thing that would be more clinically sort of applicable as as a as a as a single single test or a single scan or a single uh, measure um, by applying those uh, new sequences and um, actually we also have these inserts and stuff to basically improve the RF profile and I can talk about that another time but um, we're we're making all of those things and the scientists who are doing all this are right here on the screen like I'm I don't want to take credit for any of it because they're all like doing this work and um, and and they're making some pretty nifty things to uh, make the 70 less of a just a specialized piece of equipment and more of a clinical tool that that is comfortable and comprehensive, basically, for each and every one of these diseases. Right. Yeah. Great. And like we had similar questions yeah. when the 3T. Honestly, when the 3T was introduced to the whole, um, I guess, armamentarium of right. tools, um, some people had similar questions about that and. Uh, slowly and slowly got adopted. But interestingly, um, in a lot of the neurosurgical cases, we still are only seeing 1.5 T scans as the clinical standard of care, you know? Um, so, right. so that's also very interesting. And uh, one thing I never spoke about is like, we talk about surgical techniques and how it could be um, useful in guiding those. But what we're also exploring is 
um, things like radiation therapy. So when planning radiation therapy for things like aggressive brain tumors, which have a very high recurrence rate, and also obviously a high complication rate, um, something like this actually is the, it could be the difference between recurrence and not, you know, and um, it allows for tighter margins. It allows for sparing more normal tissue. Um, any type of highly precise imaging, which gives you very good soft tissue contrast and multiple different contrasts, um, is going to be helpful with something like that, basically. So the need exists is what I'm saying. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's great. Well, it's uh, 12, almost 12, 20, 12, 12, 30. So it's, it's, wow. it's, it's we great. Went really uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. I, I, I barely feel it. Uh, you know, it's already uh, been more than almost an hour and a half. I feel like it's going to go out for a few more hours. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but thank you so much again, Preeti, uh, for giving this uh, wonderful, you know, presentation. This is a great so again, uh, next time, uh, you know, uh, we should invite you, um, uh, you know, to give an in-person uh, visit and, uh, you know, talk here. So we'll get more time to interact with the folks here as well. 100%. So, um, yeah. I, I'd be happy to make the visit and, um, and I look forward to it. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Peter, do you want to say something? Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you. Pretty, uh, really interesting talk and, and we'll look forward to See you back in person another time. So uh, thanks again. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Yeah.